Creating authentic power requires distinguishing in yourself between love and fear. Hello and welcome to a new episode of Coming Clean Podcast. This is your host, Peter O. Estevez. And today we have none other than the incredible Gary Sukoff. Gary Sukoff is not a New York Times bestseller. He's the author of Seed of the Soul, Finding Meaning, Dancing with Woolly Masters, and of course, his latest, latest book, Universal Humans. He's also been featured in Oprah over 36 times. He is a Harvard graduate, and he also served in Special Forces in Vietnam. Hello, Gary, and welcome to Coming Clean Podcast. Hello, Peter. Thank you so much. What an interesting name for a podcast, Coming Clean. Well, you know what? There's always something that we need to come clean about, right? In life, whatever it is. And, 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 and I think that coming clean with whatever it is that is holding us back as individuals, it gives us an opportunity to become whole and complete as you and I were talking earlier, you know? And I used to run away from my demons. I used to run away from my demons into self-destruction, into alcohol, into women, into the next car, into the next suit, into the next pair of shoes and running away from me. Uh, and until I was, until I decided that I walked, that I would run towards me, I was able to find the freedom that I have today. That's, that's, that's beyond words. It's heroic. It's uh, meaningful. You can't, in my experience, you can't run from demons because they run after me. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And they, they do come in hurts, don't they, Gary? But this is not about me. This is about you. And this is about your incredible new book that you have, Universal Human. Tell us a little bit about the book, but tell us more than anything, the title, Why Universal Human? Well, I first heard those words uh, in my mind, or sometimes it's difficult for me to tell exactly where the origin is, but about 33 years ago. And immediately it, it captured my attention. And I've been opening myself to this for that length of time. So this, this idea has been working on me, which I've discovered as someone who creates uh, means uh, that the book has been working on me as long as I've been working on the book. <laughs> and I couldn't write it earlier. I wanted to, I wanted to very much, but I couldn't. I think there are other books that had to be written. I had to explore physics, the dancing woolly masters, and, and then take a shift that was most instrumental to me, most fundamental into discovering um, non-physical reality, which happened, by the way, while I was writing that book on quantum physics. I started to, uh, I got invited to a meeting of physicists at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. They were discussing things that I never would have dreamed of, Peter. They were, they were asking themselves, are we creating the reality that we're experimenting with? These were not coffee shop conversations. These were renowned theoretical physicists. And they allowed me to come back to the meeting. There were about eight or 10 of them. And I did. I wanted to share what I was, give, what I was learning because I knew I wouldn't be interested in physics for very long. And I wanted to give what I was learning through the graciousness of these men and a woman to those who were liberal arts majors didn't like mathematics, didn't know about science, like, like me. And I did. And in this process, I started writing the book as I began to be able to articulate what excited me so much in that first meeting. And I prepared outlines for chapters. <clears throat> Pardon me. And I discovered after six months that all of the chapters fit together. Yet from the very first chapter, I had thrown away my outline and gone where the energy went. So how did these chapters fit together as though I had planned them? And that's when I discovered that I wasn't writing this book alone. That's when I discovered that it's not possible to be alone. That's when I really encountered non-physical reality. And um, I decided that I intended to live my life the way this book was being written, spontaneously, intelligently, joyfully, 
And I've gone a little down that road. I have farther to go. But uh, that is the way life is so full of surprises. How could someone have first experience in non-physical reality writing a book about quantum physics that won the American Book Award for science, not for spirituality? Wow, wow. You know, Gary, when you say we're not alone, uh, you also uh, say often that we are co-creators. What does that mean we're not alone and we are co-creators in, in this universe? Well, <clears throat> the Dancing Willie Masters, all of the books that I've written were co-written. Now, I'm not a channel. I, I don't want to give anyone that impression because it couldn't be less true. I don't close my eyes and sit at a keyboard and get a book. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a dream? It is a dream. It doesn't work that way for me. I put everything that I am into a book. <coughs> <coughs> wow. Do you know, when you develop emotional awareness, which you may have, but I, I have been working on it, <coughs> I pay attention to where sensations appear in my body in different, different places, like here and here and in my throat area and my chest area. Well, this just happened in my throat area. Now, this is an energy processing center. In the East, they're called chakras, but I'm an English, not a Sanskrit speaker, so we call them energy processing centers. <clears throat> and when energy is processed, it goes up and down in your body, it's processed in one of these centers. And if it's processed in love, there's wonderful physical sensations in these areas. And if it's processed in fear, there's difficult physical sensations. And I mean physical, aching, throbbing, stabbing, burning, churning, contracting. Well, just then when I was trying to explain something, as you could see, I started coughing, my throat closed up. This area of the body has to do with communication. And when you or I or anyone have a fear that we're not able to express something the way that we want to express it or need to express it, or that if we can, it won't be understood because the other person's not listening or isn't interested, then <clears throat> this is what happens. I know you're interested and you can, and, and, you're, and you're open. I felt that from the first time we met. So the fear is that I can't express it in a way that's fresh and vital and supportive. And that's what I intend to do. So to me, I'm still awed by the irony of learning about experiencing non-physical reality while engaging in an entirely intellectual pursuit. Although it wasn't entirely, it wasn't entirely, Peter, because one of my heroes was Niels Bohr. And I knew that Niels Bohr, who was a pioneer quantum physicist, and many others, saw things beyond the five senses. Their world wasn't confined to that. And their philosophy of physics and their physics showed that. Well, their physics expressed physical phenomena, but, but they weren't able to express themselves without losing their standing in the scientific community. So when you, go, go ahead, go ahead. No, please. When you say saw things beyond the five senses, this is what you refer to as multi-sensory, right? Correct. And what does that mean for the audience that have not heard that meaning before? It means that we now have another sensory system. We've always had one. It's what we can taste and hear and see and touch and smell. These together form a single system whose object of detection is physical reality. Now we have another one. So we're multi-sensory. This new system of, uh, this new sensory system is not confined to the five senses. It is expanded far beyond them. And it changes our experience of everything, of ourselves, the world, the universe, community, relationship, gender, um, everything that you can think of changes. 
This is an epic, unprecedented transformation in human consciousness. And that's what I love to share about. Uh, when I say epic and unprecedented, I'm not speaking hyperbolically. I'm speaking accurately. Human consciousness has evolved over 300,000 years, slowly. Now it's evolving with startling velocity, faster than a heartbeat, faster than an eye blink from the previous evolutionary standard of time. And already hundreds of millions of people are being touched by multisensory perception. And Linda, Francis, my spiritual partner, and I want to support all of them and all the, all the teams that we have and all that we do to support individuals who feel multisensory perception. Some of them are frightened by it. Some of them are excited about it. Some of them are confused by it. But I can give you some examples of multisensory experiences. Please do. Please do. Uh, I'll, I'll speak now not only to you, but all of the people who are listening to us and watching us. Have you ever had the experience or the thought or sensed that you might be more than a body and a mind? That you have a, an aspect of you that is older than you and that will exist after you don't? That's a multisensory perception. Have you ever thought that, looked at the world and thought, maybe it's not random? Maybe it's not meaningless. Maybe it's meaningful. That's a multisensory perception. Have you ever looked at a starry night and said, maybe it's not inert, which is an empirical name for dead. Maybe it's more. <laughs> maybe it's even alive. Maybe it's wise. Maybe it's compassionate. It's big, but maybe it's those things too. That's a multisensory perception. So if you haven't had that kind of perception, <clears throat> and many people haven't, most people haven't, because there's seven billion of us, uh, it doesn't make you any less or we any more. It's just a temporary ebb and flow in evolution. But I'm speaking to those who have. The reason is those who haven't will not have the experience to hook on to anything that I'm saying, to attach meaning to any of these ideas. And if they're open, they'll be curious about it. If they're not open, they'll judge it immediately. That's nonsense. So I am speaking, and we are speaking now, to individuals who are touched by this new multisensory perception, the new human consciousness. We don't have to develop it. It's a gift from the universe. We just unwrap it and use it. Now, this new consciousness brings new potential, lots of them. And the biggest one, I feel, is the new experience and understanding of power as alignment of the personality with the soul. The old understanding and experience of power that five sensory humanity survived by following was the ability to manipulate and control. Wow. Now we're in new territory. And that understanding and experience of power is now toxic. What used to be good medicine for us is now poison. And so everything that we do is, and this podcast, is to help people experiment with these new realities. At first they come to people as new ideas or concepts, or maybe old ones like reincarnation, but with a new depth of experience and meaning. So we'd like to support people in experimenting. And I would like to say at the, uh, in the first part of our time together that I don't ask that anyone listening to us believe or take anything that I say is true simply because I say it. I, I uh, suggest instead that if it resonates with you in any way, experiment with it and see what that produces in your life. And if you like what it produces, experiment some more. And if you don't, throw it away. Don't try to wear a shoe that pinches. And I I, thank you. Thank you. I suggest you do this with everyone that you listen to and 
especially that you not take as true anything anyone who says who has a podcast or a television show or a book or a pulpit. Become the authority in your own life. That's creating authentic power. Wow. Wow. Become the authority in your own life. Gary, I have a couple of questions for you. When did you first discover this multisensory in yourself? And why is this shift taking place in society today? I first experienced it in a in an encounter with my deceased grandmother that I'm that we talked about just before the show started. Bye. Grandma Libby. She was my favorite. I think I was her favorite. That I don't want to be presumptuous, but I loved her. <laughs> and I would <clears throat> I would come and visit her on my way back from school. Uh, she lived in Kansas City, and I was on my way back from Harvard. I lived in Pittsburgh, Kansas, and I had to go through Kansas City to take a train down to Pittsburgh. And we would spend the night together. And she used to be quite wealthy um, uh, during the dep uh, before the Depression. And so we would lie in her little apartment and fold out the single fold-out beds. And we lie there side by side, holding hands like this, gossiping about the family. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> just enjoying being together. During those trips, she would take me to a restaurant in this large building that she was living in. And it was a lovely restaurant. And afterwards, she would take me into the lobby and she'd introduce me to people. And they all had white hair. And she'd say, Gary, you, you know Mrs. Goldstein? And I said, mm-hmm. And she'd say, well, you know Mr. Weinberg? Mm -hmm. And if I didn't say, mm-hmm, or if I started to say something, she would jerk down on my hand. She said, she, well, when I was attending the service in the funeral home, the rabbi was talking to the guest in front of him, and the family was in an alcove to his right, and at the top of the alcove was the closed circuit television. I was watching him in profile while he was delivering to another audience and closed circuit TV was so novel, it was completely new, that I laughed. <laughs> and just then, Grandma Libby jerked down on my hand and she said, shh. She shushed me. She wanted to hear her funeral. She wanted to enjoy it. And I was talking in her funeral, at her funeral. That was a multi-sensory experience. But Peter, I didn't know it. I didn't recognize it. I didn't know what to do with it. I knew not to tell my parents. They wouldn't believe. They would feel I was overcome with grief as they were. Years later, as I was writing The Dancing Wooly Masters, and I knew that I wasn't alone, that was another experience of multisensory perception. But this time, I knew what it was. And I've never forgotten. And I use it. Multisensory humans are multi-sensory and communication with non-physical guides and teachers is now becoming outside of multi-sensory perception the defining characteristic of our species so you can see how radically and dramatically we are changing from a five sensory species that evolved by surviving and survived by pursuing external power manipulation and control into a multi-sensory species that evolves by growing spiritually and to grow spiritually by creating authentic power, aligning the personality with the soul. Wow. And that's where we are now. Wow. Aligning? <laughs> wow. Aligning your personality your with the soul. Your personality with the soul. Aligning your personality with the soul. Yes. Tell us a little bit more about authentic power. Your, the intentions of your soul are harmony, cooperation, sharing, and reverence for life. <clears throat> How do you align yourself with that when your whole life has been and you yourself are magnetically attracted to discord? to competition, to hoarding, to exploitation, getting the most for the least. That's the question that millions of us are now experiencing. The only way that you can create authentic power is to 
find, which means unearth and experience the parts of your personality that don't want it, that don't want harmony or cooperation or sharing or reverence for life. These, in other words, as we become multisensory, you can look at your personality <clears throat> not as a thing or a monolithic entity. Sometimes it's happy, sometimes it's sad, sometimes it's ebullient, sometimes it's depressed. But as containing many parts, many aspects, some of them we can put into one category because they have commonalities. First of all, they're painful to experience, and secondly, when you act on them, they create destructive and painful consequences, such as the parts of your personality you experience as jealousy, anger, resentment, vengefulness, superiority and entitlement, inferiority, needing to please, and every obsession, compulsion, and addiction. Wow. All of those go in the same basket. And the label that we can put on it is fear. It's a distinctive energy current. And remember, we talked about energy processing centers. Right. When we process the energy that moves through us in fear, that's what it creates. That's what it means. It means releasing energy in fear. And you shout. You try to change the world. You do it better. You do whatever's needed to get recognition and admiration. You get another degree. You make more money. You get a more beautiful partner. You get a bigger house. You get, dread, you get longer dreadlocks. You get a better mountain bike. Whatever it is, that's pursuing external power. Now there's other parts of your personality that also have a commonality, and we can put them in another basket. These are the parts that feel wonderful to experience, for example, and when you follow them, they create blissful consequences, constructive consequences. For example, these are the parts of yourself that you experience as gratitude, caring, appreciation, uh, contentment, patience, awe of the universe. And all of these parts are in the basket that we label love. Wow. Creating authentic power requires distinguishing in yourself, in yourself, between love and fear and choosing to act from love no matter what's going on inside yourself or what's going on outside. That's creating authentic power. When you do that, while a frightened part of your personality is active, while you are angry, while you, are, while you want to shout, while you want to lash out with your words or your fist, while you want to withdraw emotionally because you're jealous, while you, while you want to stay in bed in a fetal position, while you're caught up in a manic episode, while you are, can't resist the temptation for alcohol, as we discussed, or any other addiction, sex, drugs, pornography, tobacco, shopping, gambling, while you are experiencing these magnetically powerful, attractive parts of your personality, while in that moment you are feeling that pull, you choose to reach for the healthiest part of your personality you can access and act from that. That is the moment of spiritual traction. That's when the spiritual rubber meets the spiritual road. That's creating authentic power. And as you do that again and again and again and again and again, you begin to become, to develop authentic power. Wow. So it's a muscle we're developing, just like it's, it's a muscle that we are developing. It's through a process of a ritual and, and, and doing it over and over and over again. Are we innately uh, conditioned to do this? Not as five sensory humans, no. Uh, five sensory humans who wanted to do, who wanted to develop this. And by the way, this is the muscle. It's not a muscle. 
<laughs> you want to use that analogy. Yeah, thank you. This is the muscle we were born to develop. But when we were five century, people who wanted to develop it would withdraw from society into hermitages, uh, no, into nunneries or monasteries. The people who wanted to look inside themselves and see these currents and, and see what their inner dynamics were. And then those who were really committed would withdraw from the monastery or the nunnery into hermitages where they only receive one meal a day. And this is the uh, worn out icon of a meditator or someone who's on a spiritual path is a meditator in a cave on a mountain in the Himalayas. That's, those days are past. How can you withdraw? Why would you want to withdraw from society when all of society, all of the human species is now beginning its journey on a spiritual path? Your interactions with others form the basis of your spiritual development. Wow. If necessary. Wow. A couple of questions, Gary, and I want to take you a little bit back for our audience that's <laughs> not advanced in this type of development. When you first recognized that nudging from Grandma Levy, at what point did you process that and you recognize that as being a multi-sensory experience? The experience of what? I didn't hear you. Uh, that nudge from Grandma Libby at her funeral when you were this oh. and you realize at that moment, well, not at that moment particularly, but now you know that that was a multi-sensory experience. At what point did you realize that that's what it was and how did you begin to develop and, and notice those type of experiences as being multi-sensory experiences? I didn't have a word for it then. I just knew something was happening and it was good. And I told a friend who was a Jungian analyst and she said, oh, Gary, be careful. You don't know what, you're, what you might be tapping into. But I knew. <laughs> she was frightened. I wasn't frightened. That's when I said, I want more of this. I'm going to work with this. That's when I decided to live my life like this book was written because I'd never experienced anything like it before. Wow. And I, and I cultivated that. I cultivated it. Now, after the... Dancing with Woolly Masters was published. It was an immediate success, which surprised everybody, most of all me, because I was excited because I'd never written a book before and I never had an interest in science before. And the thing I was least interested in was physics. And I wrote a book about physics and it won the American Book Award for Science. It got a rave review in the New York Times the day it was published. And it was published around the world. So... This experience happened before the book was published. I was still writing the book. But after the book was published, I withdrew. I got a big head. But not the way some people get a big head, like, look at me, I'm an author. No, I was saying, no, no, it really was nothing. Thank you, thank you, but it wasn't, it wasn't me. But I pushed people away like that. Why did you do that? <clears throat> because I was frightened. Ah. Uh -huh. That's why I was addicted to sex. That's why I was addicted to, that's why I rode motorcycles so that people would admire me because I admire me doing that. That's why, uh, that's why I joined the army. That's why I became a Green Beret and a paratrooper because I wanted to be admired. I needed to. But, 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 really, but Gary, excuse me for interrupting you, but the majority of society operates in that manner. We do things based on ego base. So when do we begin to discover that we no longer want to operate from that? When do we begin to discover that we want to seek our authentic power, even if we don't know what that is? When your life becomes too painful to bear. Ah. This is the road well-traveled. This is when something brings you to your knees, a child dies, a doctor says, your parent is dying. The doctor says, you're dying. That's the time that most people open themselves to a spiritual alternative. But I'm saying now to everyone who's listening and watching, you don't have to wait that long. And you don't have to do it just to put yourself out of pain. You do it because you're drawn to something, not running from something. Wow. And that something, 
That something is calling you. That something is meaning. And as you follow that, it will take you deeper and deeper into itself, into meaning. In other words, creating authentic power is the only way that you can move beyond the control of frightened parts of your personality, of fear, and give the gifts that you were born to give. That's where your meaning lies. That's where your fulfillment lies. Wow. Wow. Gary, I understand that in the process, once you are at a point where you have created that authentic power, we look at the Dalai Lama, we look at many, many of our great um, spiritual leaders that, that, that have been able to reach those heights. But in the process of developing the muscle, as you call it, not a muscle, but the muscle, how do we coexist in a five sensory reality? Bingo. That is the question, Peter. That is the question that everybody who is multi-sensory and pulling and feeling the pull of these things is asking, how do I do that? You may not even think of yourself as a spiritual person, but the realization is, my God, I'm waking up. You are waking up as a spiritual person in a world that doesn't yet recognize spirit. Now what do you do? And by the way, it's not as though this isn't a process that you adopt. You hear me talking, you hear Peter talking and on his other podcasts and something resonates with you and you begin to follow it. Well, earlier in this podcast, we talked about demons. Or maybe that was before the... I've forgotten, but it was a good conversation because we talked about demons that drove you into drinking, that drove me into sexual addiction, that drove... And as we talked about them, everybody's got them, by the way. Right. Everybody. And by the way, demon sounds mystifying. Let me spell it out. To be human is to have, is to share an experience with every other human. It is a core human experience. It is, the, it is the experience of wanting to belong and not belonging. Wow. It is the experience of wanting to be loved and being unlovable. It is the experience of wanting to love and knowing that you're not capable. It's not wanting anyone to see you as you see yourself inside because they wouldn't want to have anything to do with you. Wow. It's the experience of knowing that you're intrinsically flawed, inherently defective, and it's excruciating. It's excruciating pain. This is the pain of powerlessness. And everyone, every personality, five sensory and multi-sensory has it. While we were five sensory, we tried to mask the pain of powerlessness by focusing outward and changing the world. Wow. That's the pursuit of external power. And it was futile. The most you can get from pursuing external power is temporary happiness. You make a fortune and you ride to the top of a roller coaster, allegorically speaking. But then the market comes, 1929, 2008. The markets always come and go like that. And suddenly, everything's gone. And you're at the bottom of the roller coaster. That happiness was ephemeral. You experienced it because you got what a frightened part of your personality wanted and usually desperately needed. When you create authentic power, it's not about happiness. You are creating in you joy. Joy is something you ignite inside yourself. Wow. Joy is independent of the external world. It doesn't matter what's happening in the external world. The joy is in you. That's why creating authentic power turns you exactly in the direction you need to go, which is inside, because Inside, in your internal dynamics, are the origins of your painful experiences of fear 
in your blissful experiences of love. And as you create authentic power, you challenge the parts of your personality that are originate in fear. You don't go to war with them. You're not in combat. You simply recognize them. And you say to them and to yourself, no more. Like to your anger, to your jealousy. So you're not going to control me anymore. Not now. This is where it stops. That is challenging. Then you reach for the healthiest part of your personality you can and act from that part. Then if you're like me, usually it comes back and you act on it again. And again, you challenge it. Until finally, you begin to move beyond its control. It takes courage. It takes commitment. It takes conscious communication and action. It takes compassion. By the way, these are these are all things that we put together as a, a symbol for you as a authentic power guidelines. You can download them at seatofthesoul.com. They're free. Take a look at them. And if any of them resonate with you, experiment with it. So I brought up this thing about demons because one of the things we discussed was you can't run away from your demons because they run after you. Absolutely. Well, once you have sensed meaning in your life, Peter, once you have looked at it, once it's even peeked at you or you peeked at it, it goes after you. Wow. You can't forget. You can't unlearn what you've learned when you had a glimpse of meaning of real purpose. You don't have to follow that glimpse. You don't have to. But it'll always be there beckoning to you. It's like this. Um, every, many people in their lives have experiences of grace. Grace is a, a gift from the universe in which for a moment you experience your life without fear. You're struggling because you're marriage or your family's falling apart or your business is dissolving or your children won't talk to you or what, whatever it is and there's tremendous pain the pain of power of fear powerlessness and suddenly it's gone for a moment it's gone and you can relate to them or even think about them in a different way without fear and it's wonderful then it goes away. That is a gift from the universe. And once you've experienced grace, then it's your job to transform that experience into an ongoing, stabilized presence in your life. Wow. Wow. Fascinating, Gary. Fascinating. Tell me, COVID, Corona, has that accelerated multi-sensory awareness? No. A multi-sensory perception is a gift from the universe. It touches individuals whether they have a virus or they don't. And I didn't necessarily mean the virus, but the... The, the, I didn't the whole thing, the whole thing, yes, the yeah. pandemic. The pandemic. Yes. No, that's not affecting multi-sensory perception. But it's offering opportunities to create authentic power. There's four chapters in Universal Human on the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, I labeled each of them the coronavirus miracle. The first one is the coronavirus miracle. Why? The coronavirus miracle, the pandemic. The coronavirus miracle, the protest. The coronavirus miracle, the symbol. The coronavirus pandemic will be seen as a turning point in human behavior and evolution. It's not the turning point. The turning point was the emergence of multi-sensory perception. The shift from, multi, from five sensory to multi-sensory from external power to authentic power. But following that shift, this is a major event because it affects everyone around the world, regardless, period, regardless. 
and it's not going away quickly, and it's not going to. Or it gives new meaning and depth to the idea we're all in this together. Right. But not everyone will use those opportunities. The Earth School, by the way, presents opportunities to grow spiritually, to create authentic power, moment by moment by moment. Every moment of anger or jealousy or resentment or kindness or patience is an opportunity to challenge fear or, or cultivate love. So the corona virus pandemic protest occurrence in human history is significant. And I'll be interested in hearing your thoughts about it when you read those chapters in, in Universal Human. Absolutely. And I, I would love to talk to you about it after I, I read the chapters. And the reason I brought that up is because I saw the pandemic as an opportunity for us as a collective to slow down, to come closer together, even though we were apart. Right. And for the first time, we were not distracted uh, by by the fast pace of life. We actually had time where we, we were confined to our homes, our environments and had it had the ability to be able to connect as human beings from a completely different perspective, not from what I, what I want or what you want, but what do we need? How do we survive? How do we become? So to, to me, to me was, it, it was a first opportunity in my lifetime, in my generation, to be able to see something of that immensity uh, uh, that brought people together and yet brought many apart. So that's the only reason. So if, if, if there was something within me that it gave me an opportunity to feel life from a completely different perspective that I had not experienced in my generation. I agree with you 100%. This is this mandated pause in our mindless life, our robotic, robotic repetition of what Right. And conscious life is mandated. Us, that was a great. It's a great way to uh, put it. It gave us an ex, an experience, just just like what you described, of the importance of people, not for what they can do, but because they are. Right. And the closeness that we feel, and yet in the lockdowns that were necessary, we couldn't act on that, and so we had to come to terms with that inside ourselves with the importance of people, the importance of life, without masking it by hugging someone or smiling or chatting. You get to feel it, how big it is, how loving you are. Well, we're in agreement on that, Peter. It's And by the way, uh, it's not only in your generation. It's in human history. Uh, because this pandemic is occurring at the same time that electronic communication makes us all very close. Uh, nothing like this happened in the time of the bubonic plague or in the time of smallpox or in the time of polio. But now we're all in this together. We can talk about it. We can communicate. Everybody is using that common word, pivoting to right. all women. And we're all seeing how much we suffer right now. In other parts of the world, the suffering is intense, more so even than we had in the United States. Not only in India and Brazil and Peru, but in places that have been demonized by us and that demonize us, demonize us like Iran. The deaths there are huge in number. The suffering is unspeakable. So all of this presents us with rich opportunities to create authentic power, to challenge the parts of us that demonize other people, and to see them for who they are, fellow students in the Earth School, with frightened and loving parts of their personalities. The, the characteristics of an authentically powerful personality are humbleness, clarity, forgiveness, and love. A humble person walks, walks in a humble world, walks in a friendly world. Everyone in that world belongs there. That person 
realizes that everyone in the world has a life that's as difficult and complex and labyrinthine and challenging and potentially rewarding as his or her own. Wow. Gary, from your book, um, Seed of the Soul, you talk a lot about spiritual partners. What is a spiritual partner and how do we find one? You create authentic power is how you find one and they find you. Spiritual partnership is partnership between equals for the purpose of spiritual growth. It's a new archetype. It's never existed in human history or experience before. While we were five century, the, the idea of a relationship between equals in order to grow spiritually did not exist. Equality did not exist. I mentioned earlier that your interactions with others form the basis of your spiritual development. When you, this is true regardless who it is, every interaction activates either frightened or loving parts of your personality. And you are required to choose one or the other. If you don't do it consciously, you choose it unconsciously. In other words, putting this in a different context, but equally accurate, we are standing with one foot in the old consciousness and one foot in the new consciousness. Wow. How will you respond from the old consciousness and pursue external power or from the new consciousness and use the occasion to align your personality with your soul, no matter what that occasion is. It's looking with the knowing, with the understanding that every experience in the earth school serves the purpose of bringing the consciousness of your soul into the awareness of your personality. Often those experiences are not experiences that the personality would choose. Yet they are always present. Now in this continual ongoing learning environment of the earth school, which is the domain of the five senses, which is five sensory perception, which is now including multi-sensory perception. As you are creating authentic power, which means not mystical, not spiritual, just means having to do with your soul. So yes, it's spiritual because your soul wants harmony. Like anger was a big part of my life. And I knew it. And I used to take pride in it was part of my identity. I would tell people that were asking, yeah, I'm angry. I've always been angry. I'm always going to be angry. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> so I didn't realize how much pain I was in. I didn't realize how much I was isolating myself from people. They wouldn't confide in me. They didn't want to be close. They were frightened to become close. And I was isolated. And the more isolated I became, the more angry I became. And I was so frightened that I, as I said, became an officer in the military, an elite officer in the military, an elite officer in an elite part of the military, the Green Berets. And I didn't realize it was all driven by fear. The street name for this condition is macho. Yes, yes. And that's what I was. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'll finally I'm finally coming back to your question, Peter, okay. about spiritual partnership. In all of this, when you encounter someone else who is also striving to grow spiritually, to move beyond the control of their anger and their jealousy and their resentment and their inferiority or their superiority, then you recognize in someone else your own ambitions your own aspirations is a better word. And that gives you an opportunity to enter into this new relationship dynamic, which is replacing every relationship dynamic and will, spiritual partnership. It's got its own, it's an archetype with its own dynamics. And there's a book about it called Spiritual Partnership. And you can read that. One of the, I mean, it, it's got startling dynamics. Here's one of them. Spiritual partners share the thing they most 
fear will destroy their partnership. Wow. wow. Because they know that if they don't, something that big will create a chasm between them that will forever prevent the intimacy they want with one another. Spiritual partners know they have souls. They know there's a reason for their being together. And that reason has to do with their souls. Wow. Is your spiritual partner the same as your romantic partner? Could be. But if you look at your partner as a romantic partner, no. Romanticism, sentimentalism, these are all experiences of fear, of need. Love is not painful. Need is. Unrequited need is excruciating. <laughs> you want her and she doesn't want you. You want him and he's found someone else. Unrequited love is nonsense. Love doesn't have any requisitions. It is. Yes. You, in fact, I used one of your quotes, quotes the other day. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't love her more. I don't love her less. I just love her. <laughs> I, I, I used it the other day. It's an incredible quote. Thank you. Thank you. Gary, yeah. Gary, we're coming up uh, at the end of the, uh, at the hour, and, and I, want, I want the audience to know a little bit more about Universal Human Book and where they can find it and what other projects you're working on besides your podcast. Oh, so many. Linda and I realized that um, we're not going to live indefinitely. We sort of knew that throughout our lives, but now it's a reality. <laughs> the mountain is closer. And while we're still here, we want to uh, provide a place that people who are interested in authentic power can come after we leave the earth school, where the water is always clear and the well is deep. Oh, wow. And where they can learn about these things without them being mixed up with other modalities, which can be quite helpful, like this kind of meditation or that kind of meditation or inner child, or this is just authentic power and spiritual partnership. So we created a brand new website, seatofthesoul.com. Same address as the old one, but you'll be surprised when you go there now. Uh, we're creating uh, online courses, self-paced. Uh, the first one is uh, just nearing uh, within a month or so, we can have it up. Uh, we are developing social media uh, like we've never done before. We've, we've always had a few things and put a few things up. But now um, uh, we're, we're, we're working toward even beyond what we have now. It's pretty. It's nice. It's empowering with its thoughts. But we want it to be supportive. So we're shifting that into something even better, which means more supportive. Uh, oh, here's a big one community. We're right now creating the infrastructure for a soul-to-soul -soul community. Wow. Communications from the heart. We're going to go into beta testing probably at the end of this month with people who've been through our events or activities or courses and they, and they know that they want to interact in a community that's focused in this way. That's got in it multi-sensory uh, humans, which doesn't mean, by the way, We'll go into another conversation about communities next time, but there's only one real community. That's the biggest community that has no exclusions. That's life. Wow. Within that, we are creating a community where people can support one another consciously in creating authentic power. The Universal Human Book, which you've pointed out, has, has been published. All of this we intend to integrate in a way that no where somebody approaches it, whether they're a newcomer or just uh, heard about or heard, heard me on a podcast or whether they're someone who uh, remembers me from seeing me on an Oprah show, they'll find something that will support them, that will meet them where they are, that will be meaningful and relevant. So they can do what I suggested at the beginning of this podcast. See if anything resonates with them, try it out, and then use it if it does, because authentic power is not a theory. It's not a philosophy. It's not a hope. It's a substantial, relative, 
access, accessible, obtainable goal for, for multi-sensory humans. And so when I say anything about authentic power, test it. Take everything that we've said, twist it, turn it, bang on it, jump up and down on it. See if you can break it. You can't. It's your life you're experimenting with. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Gary Suka. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. It's a joy.